Well, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, please be seated. God bless you all, and good morning. I think I just accidentally left the meeting on Zoom. <laughs> so let's uh, reconnect here real quick. All right. <laughs> Little technical difficulty. All right. Well, good morning. I once, uh, many years ago, had a friend who was desperately in love with a woman and her name was Joy, and his name was Robert. And now I know that I told you a few months ago that I once had a roommate who was broken up with by a woman named Hope, and I tried my best to not say things like, well, it's not like you're hopeless, or like, oh, there's always hope, or hey, let's uh, keep hope alive. Well, I also had a friend, these are true stories, who was madly in love with a woman named Joy, and the humorous thing with that, because she did not uh, accept that. She was like, thank you, but I'm not interested. And so he was spurned uh, and, and was very sad about this. And it was around Christmas time, and I love listening to Christmas music. And I remember when he wasn't around, I was playing that song, Joy to the World, which starts with people harmonizing the word joy. It's like four times. You're like, joy, 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 joy. I was like, all right, let's not play this when Robert is around. But he was so in love and just wanted Joy to date him. And he, he was like, I prayed about it. I feel like God is telling me that we're supposed to be together. And I said, well, if God is not telling Joy that, then maybe you need to get over it and let it go. <laughs> and in the end, it didn't work out. And as a result, Robert was kind of, you know, it was obviously a low point for him, but in that low point, he was so sad that he ended up going to therapy and he worked on something. He decided to use it as an opportunity to confront, look a little more inward. And in the end, you know, years later, Joy married someone has a great life and Robert married someone else. And in the end, he's kind of happy that he didn't end up with Joy because it led him down a better path. And isn't that, doesn't that happen to us so often where we long for something that we so desperately want? And then it doesn't happen, and you're like, oh, this is actually much better that it didn't work out. Or sometimes we long for things that actually aren't that good for us. Maybe you're longing for a promotion or a different job, and that job won't actually bring you happiness. Uh, you're pretty good at where you're at, but for whatever reason, societal reasons, pressures from you know whomever in your life, it's like, well, you need to have this title. You need to pursue this. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And you end up going for a job or a title or a role that you don't actually want or like. Uh, I've heard, I don't know exactly who, but someone became bishop of a diocese in the Episcopal Church. And being bishop is very different from being a priest in a parish. Uh, and within a couple years, he realized, I really don't like being bishop. And was only in the role for a handful of years and then decided to retire from that and just go back to parish life. So sometimes that goal we have, that thing we long for, isn't actually what we want or what will be best for us. And this also happens in uh, things that we buy, right? As Americans, our humanity is often defined by what we buy. We're referred to as consumers, not necessarily humans. And so our identity and what, who we are is wrapped up in what we purchase. And uh, that can be problematic for us as Christians, where we want our identity to be rooted in our Christian faith. And uh, I've talked about this before, but it's a good refresher, that in the early 20th century, there was a philosophical school of thought coming out of Frankfurt, Germany, that was referred to as the Frankfurt School. And their criticism of capitalism and consumerism was this. They said that in consumerism and capitalism, you have... The people producing goods and the people down here consuming goods and the producers of the goods aren't just building goods to sell, right? They're not just producing a widget and saying, here's a widget. They're also defining the meaning associated with the widget and then pushing down on us 
that meaning, that culture, and that significance that they have associated with this widget or whatever the product is. So then we are just mindless zombies doing what the advertisers are telling us to do, consuming whatever they tell us to consume. So an example would be if they equated a, a certain type of shoe with say like excellence, or in my case, say like these shoes will make you a really good preacher, right? And it's like, oh, I need these shoes, and then all of a sudden I get caught up in that, and in the Frankfurt School I'm this mindless zombie, so I go and I buy these shoes, but I have an incredibly wide foot. And so what if I go and it just doesn't fit right, it makes my back hurt to stand around in these shoes, but I've bought into this idea that these are associated with excellence in preaching, and so I just have to have it. So I'm longing for something that's actually bad for me, and that I um, don't want and it'll make my life worse, right? Well, as Christians, as we approach this subject, we can look at it with a little more nuance, right? And that's where the Bur after the Frankfurt School became a little well-known in academic cir circles, in Birmingham, England, a school of thought arose to kind of counter the Frankfurt School, and they said, yes, it seems like that is how the structure of consumerism in capitalistic societies is. The producers are trying to define the meaning and push it down on us as zombie consumers. But the Birmingham School said, we're more intelligent than that. We're more nuanced. And so they're trying to do that, but I can purchase products and I can renegotiate what the meaning is for me. So, you know, they'll say like, say you drive a car like a BMW and, and BMW says, well, you'll buy this to show the world like you're successful or, you enjoy the highest performing vehicle possible or whatever their advertisements say, right? Well, maybe you get in and you really like the BMW and something about it, maybe it reminds you of someone in your past or something. And so you'll buy it because you're like, whenever I sit in it, it makes me want to pray for people in my life or it makes me filled with gratitude or whatever it is that you would do to re-narrate the meaning of purchasing that product. Because we live in an income-based society, we don't produce all of our own goods, and so we do have to buy things as Christians. But we don't necessarily have to adopt the meaning that the producers are selling us. Because they're not just selling a meaning for that good, but they're also selling you your identity. Right? If you remember from like the late 90s, there was a, a commercial campaign and at the end it said, uh, you are your khakis, which is just kind of ridiculous, right? It's like, I'm not my khaki, I'm not, I'm, my identity's not wrapped up in a pair of pants. Let's hope, right? But they're, they're explicitly saying, you are the khakis that you wear. Or another example is uh, about 15 years ago when DirecTV was still a lot more popular, now a lot of people do the streaming thing. But DirecTV was popular, they had an ad where it would show at the top like a satellite in outer space. And then down below you'd see like a family sitting on a sofa watching TV. And the tagline said, someone up there loves you. <laughs> and so it's replacing God with the purveyor of television, right? And so buy DirecTV and then you will be fully loved. <laughs> and so we as Christians... It's good for us to be aware that this is the system we live in and to interrogate how our own identity as we walk through this system. To interrogate how the world around us is trying to warp and shape our desires. Because it can make it so we are longing for and wanting things that are actually not good for us. And in today's gospel passage, Jesus is telling the disciples it's in Holy Week and Jesus is saying, I'm going to leave, but don't be troubled. It'll be for the best. And I can, we don't hear the disciples' response, but I can imagine they were like, no, I don't want you to go. You're Jesus. We've been with you for multiple years. We've given our lives to you. I don't want you to leave. And they're longing for this thing that's not part of God's story. 
And if they had their way, uh, Jesus would have stayed. And I can sympathize with their plight. Their friend is about to go away. And they're going to miss him and they don't want it. But God's story means that this is just the way things had to be. And in this Easter season, as we proclaim the resurrection, the story had to have Jesus conquering and overcoming death. So that's an essential part of that story. And so it had to happen that way, despite the disciples being sad and just desperately not wanting it. And Jesus says in today's passage, unless I go, you won't get the Holy Spirit coming to you. So for the, the ultimate end of the story, what's ultimately best for you is this thing that you really, really don't want. Now, as I've talked today about our preferences for things and longing for things, and when we don't get it, sometimes that's for the best. I'm talking about like our individual preferences, right? Like um, if you really want America to be less racist, that's great. I'm not talking about that, right? I'm talking more on like a micro level of how you choose your own preferences and that type of thing and how you navigate the world as someone who has to purchase things. Or how is your identity as a faithful follower of God? And really, when we long for these things here on earth, you know, we, I'm sure we've all done it where you're like, oh, I really want this thing, but I don't know, it's kind of expensive, or I don't know. When we really desperately long for something like that, sometimes it's really, we're not feeling connected to God. And it's that longing for connection, that longing to be with God, and to feel that love. And when that's not going well, then we find that, oh, well, maybe if I buy this thing, then that will fulfill all my needs and that will fulfill all my desires. Or maybe if I marry this person, everything will be complete. We'll live happily ever after and life is perfect. And it's like even if you find the perfect person to marry, uh, it still won't fulfill everything, right? And you can't have these things here on earth replace that longing for and that connection that comes with God. And so I know in my life when I find myself longing for, oh, I need to buy this. It'd be so great if I bought this. Sometimes it's like, okay, what's going on here? I think I really need to get praying a little harder. I need to devote a little more time and attention to my longing for and my connection to God. And this may be great. If I buy this, it might be nice but it won't ultimately fulfill me. And so if I get back to that connection with God, then I may still be able to buy this thing, but I don't have to get wrapped up in the false narrative that that will fulfill all of my needs and replace my need to be connected with God. And so ideally we gather on Sunday mornings, we're reminded of this longing and this need to connect with God, and then we go out into the world and we're loving people, loving our neighbors, and we're purchasing things, but we're not allowing the uh, producers to identify our, to narrate our own identity as we buy these products. We can buy it, but it doesn't own us. Amen. Amen.